Good morning. Welcome to Deadly Days, Tales of Dark Fantasy, Episode 11. I'm Joe Bandle, and uh, today <coughs> we're going to try another story. This is going to be a story by Hans Heinz Avers uh, called Typhoid Mary. But before we do that, I want to mention just a few things. Uh, I translate these stories into English, and I also publish them in book form on my web page or at Lulu, Lulu Publishing. So you can either look up a Google search under my own name, Joe Bandel, band like a rock and roll band, E-L, or go to lulu.com, L-U-L-U dot com slash spotlight slash anarchist banjo. Or just uh, look on there for my publications and you'll find them. I'm currently working on uh, just finishing up Vol uh, book two of a short stories by Carl Hans Strobel. It, I expect it to be out for publication uh, for the public uh, within a week. So that's ex exciting news. Then uh, I'm going to do some more, a uh, couple issues of Der Orchidean Garten, which originally was produced in the German language in 1919. I'm doing translations of those with the original artwork and publishing those. Uh, and the, there's lots coming. But anyway, that's pretty much uh, Der Orchidean Garten, of course, uh, the world's first fantasy, illustrated fantasy magazine that came out in 1919. So anyway, these stories come from a time period that's called the, a time period of German decadent literature, which is from about the 1890s to the 1920s. That's kind of the ballpark area that I really am fascinated by. And I believe that these stories, if you listen to these stories, you're going to find them fascinating because they contain a kind of energy that you don't find in today's world anymore. And I believe it's an energy that we need. Okay, on to our story, Typhoid Mary. The little hole was only dimly lit. The windows were covered. The tables pushed together and covered with a green cloth so that it looked like one large table. Behind it sat six people, Erwin Erhardt, Siegfried Lowenstein, Count Thalassio Thun, Walter von X, Hans Del Greco, and Randolph Ulbin. A seventh chair sat empty. In front of the green table, almost in the middle of the room, stood a large leather chair, and next to it a small end table. There was an ashtray on it, a box of matches, and a pack of cigarettes. There is not much else in the room. The six men waited. They scarcely spoke. Fragments of jazz came from Hotel Carmen across the bay. Siegfried Lowenstein was an attorney in his forties, a Jew, but even more, a Rhinelander, a war veteran of four years who had been awarded the Blue Max. Him. Sir Hans Del Greco was from Trieste. He was a ship's lieutenant of the former Austrian Navy. 
And now that Rome was paying his pension, he was trying to rebuild his Gortzera property, which had been destroyed by the Italians. Thessalothon was a Bohemian baron of some obscure lineage. He was in his fifties. His watery blue eyes fluttered and his lips trembled. Dr. Erwin Earhart was an industrial engineer from the Rhine. Engineer and inventor. Very rich, elegant, and distinguished. Dark-haired and slender. Randolph Olbein was short and round, white, blonde hair. His hands looked like those of a butcher with manicured nails. He was CEO of the Olbein branches in Hamburg and New York, an American citizen, so his millions were secure. Baron Walter von Ax was a painter and lived in Munich. His hair was gray even though he was not yet 30 years old. All six waited, smoked, and drank, but didn't speak. Then the door opened, and Colonel Lionel Thursby stepped inside. He wore small scars from his Gotenner student days on his left cheek, and a large red one across his forehead, which came from Flanders. His black eyes, his black eyes glowed. She's here, he said. A lady entered, tall and slender. The colonel locked the door behind her and removed the key. Without speaking, he motioned to the big chair in the middle of the room. Then he went to the table, placed the key in front of the attorney, who sat in the middle, and sat down in the empty chair by the window. The tall woman didn't sit down. Why did you lock the door, she cried. Am I to be held here by force? Dr. Lowenstein nodded. It appears that way. The woman took a step forward. This looks like a tribunal. Are you perhaps wanting to sit in judgment over me? Again, the attorney nodded. It appears that way. She laughed out loud. Please, she said, I am completely at your disposal. She sat down in the easy chair, crossed her legs, and lit a cigarette. Go ahead, gentlemen. I am curious. The attorney stared across at her. He hadn't seen the woman in eight years, and she was exactly the same as she had been before. She hadn't aged a bit. She wiggled her narrow feet, which were stuck into pointed gray shoes. Her silk stockings were gray like her charmoise dress. She wore an old Spanish shawl over her shoulders, whose colored flowers were so faded they were almost lost in the deep violet. She carried long deerskin gloves in one hand, and in the other a small purse adorned with pearls. Her skin was tanned, quite healthy. A pearl necklace wound through her rich, dark hair, and another, even larger one, lay around her throat. But her rings bore black pearls. Perhaps she was not beautiful, but she looked as if she could have a very beautiful sister. Only her eyes were striking. Yellow gold with brown, green, and white, like those of a large forest toad. How old is she anyway, the attorney asked himself. He had seen her that morning by the pool in a black swimming suit. None of the other ladies had a figure like hers. She is certainly older than 40, he considered, probably closer to 50 or even older. And no one that encountered her thinks she is older than 25. It is amazing, he thought. Mary Stuyvesant flicked the ash into the ash tray. Seriously, gentlemen, she said calmly, would one of you like to explain what this is all about? Because I don't see the humor in it. 
especially today. I'm not in the mood for jokes because I have just received some news that has troubled me. The attorney picked up a telegram from the table. Perhaps it is the same one that re we received. Young Dr. Terhune has shot himself in Zurich. But you will soon see, dear lady, that we are not here to play jokes. Mary Stoyvesant interrupted him. Why the dear lady, Friedel? She smiled at him. You have aged a bit since the last time I saw you. And where is that bushy hair? But please, will you just tell me what this seriousness is all about? Look, I am not entirely unprepared. You want something of me. I've known that for a long time. Last winter I met Count Thun at the opera in Vienna. In casual conversation I mentioned that I didn't yet know where I wanted to spend the spring. Two months later he wrote to me and recommended Isle Brioni. I would like it. It had everything that I could desire. Quiet and yet the best of company. Solitude if I wanted it, and dance and music if I wanted something else. And, and, well, in short, everything. Then four weeks later he wrote me again asking whether I had received his letter and if I had decided to travel to Isle Brioni. Really? I only decided to go because this courtesy was so unlike him that I had come to suspect that he had some other intentions. But he was right to give me that bit of advice, and I am very grateful to him for it. The first person I encountered on the pier was Colonel Thursby. He told me that he was now working for the embassy in Rome and had come here to recuperate. But he did not tell me that he knew I would be coming here. Then five days later, Del Greco came. And today, exactly two weeks after my arrival, you are all here because of me, right, Friedel? The attorney nodded. Most certainly. Thank you, said the beautiful woman. That is certainly very flattering, but it now appears to me that there is no one here whom I have not had some kind of dispute with. It does seem rather strange that you would entice me here, because that is what really happened. And then follow me. It must certainly be good for the hotel, seven guests at the same time. There could have easily been seventy and even more, said Miss said Dr. Lowenstein. Ladies and gentlemen, and in a way we represent all the others. So this, so a type of advisory board, said Mary. And you gentlemen represent the absent shareholders. It certainly appears that I have in some way injured your cor corporation, and that is why you have compelled me and permit me to say in a very original way, to appear before your tribunal. So present your case, Mr. Chairman. In these years, Miss Mary Stoyvesant, there is much that happens in the world that smacks of force rather than justice. Once we determined to hold you, we didn't care all that much if things went right and proper. You can understand that. The main thing is now that we have you here, we can share with you what we have to say. And as for there being seven of us, I am of the opinion that we represent all of humanity, at least as far as they, directly or indirectly, have come in contact with you or ever will. I bid you very much, Lady Mary, to calmly listen to us. We believe that we can share things about yourself that you don't even know, or at least never from our perspective. You will have plenty of opportunity to answer and then to act. 
He opened the leather briefcase in front of him and took out a thick stack of papers. This letter, he continued, gave the impetus to our action. Colonel Thursby sent it to Dr. Earhart over a year ago, who then shared it with me. You must hate me very much, Colonel, the woman turned to the Englander. Most certainly, said the Englander, you have driven two of my brothers and my sister to their graves. You have turned my life into a hell. Oh, most certainly I hate you. Marie Stuyvesant shrugged her shoulders. Continued, Friedel. We discussed what could be done. I will not hide from you that for a long time we debated on whether it would be possible to turn you over to the authorities or turn to judges and psychiatrists in an attempt to rid society of you. We only dropped this idea because, even though the poison of Maurice Stuyvesant enjoys an almost international acclaim, we could see that there was scarcely any valid evidence that could be used against you. So we decided to deal with it ourselves. We sat down with everyone we knew or heard of that had ever been in contact with you. In a small number of cases, we found solid proof in which, through the influence of your personality, through your drawings and your books, these people met their downfall. We spent this past year collecting material for this case. Marie Stavant, Stuyvesant, from out of hundreds of hidden crevices in all parts of Europe and the Americas, and if I might be permitted to say from all around the entire world. Naturally, it is not in the slightest complete, but there is more than enough material to give you, Miss Stuyvesant, a clear picture of what your life means for the rest of human society. He took a notebook out of the briefcase and handed it to the painter who was sitting on his right. This is, he declared, a monograph by your friend, the young Dr. Raymond de Alia, about... Ms. Marie interrupted him. The gentleman was never my friend. He visited me during the war years at my studio in Seville twice, three times at the most. At the time, I had a craving for cocaine, and he provided it for me. That is certainly correct, confirmed Dr. Lowenstein. The young Spaniard provided you with what you wanted. Unfortunately, he then took cocaine himself. I didn't encourage him to do that, declared the lady. That is also true, answered the attorney. Don Ramon wrote that himself. Yet he saw you take cocaine and then took it himself. He became addicted to it. Today he is in an institution and incurable. From him we received this very interesting monograph over the case of George Quintero, which if you compare them with your own case does form a striking analogy. Many such cases of germ carriers have often been observed, but this presentation is especially clear and simple. A brief summary of the facts will be enough for us. I have provided a short excerpt. Would you be so kind as to read it to us, Baron? Walter von Axe read, George Quintero was born 1882 in Ronda, and Andalusia, a son of farmers. During his military service, he served with his regiment for a time in Morocco. It was later determined that during this time, several soldiers had been infected with typhoid. After the regiment returned to Malaga, a genuine epidemic broke out. After his discharge from the military, Quintero worked on various farms as a laborer in the Vega area of Granada 
and on every single farm he infected the household with typhus. At the time, the simple peasants were so alarmed at these events that George, who had always been loved for being a pleasant, hard-working, and handsome man, was openly considered as the bearer of misfortune. Then he found a job as a nurse in a hospital in Granada, because in the army he had trained to work in the infirmary. Scarcely two weeks later, a typhus epidemic broke out in the hospital that took the lives of no less than 54 people. The hospital had to be provisionally shut down and the personnel were dismissed. George then found employment in various places in Granada, Jan, and later in Seville. And in all those places, he infected people with typhoid. Finally, he once more found work as a nurse in Seville, and none of the doctors in the hospital knew anything about his past history. Several months later, the worst outbreak of typhus that Seville had ever seen occurred at that hospital. The death toll was nearly 1,400. Through a coincidence, suspicion fell on George. A farmer's wife recognized him as the fellow who, she thought, had brought death into her house. Her husband and two of her children had been killed by typhus. This woman raised such an outcry, both in the hospital and on the streets, that she was finally taken into custody. When questioned, she made convincing statements. They investigated and solidly determined that what she was saying was true. In no time at all, the entire past history of the unfortunate man was determined. He willingly provided all the places where he had worked, and it only needed to be confirmed. Quintero was then arrested and placed in solitary confinement, but soon released after the court hearing because there was not the slightest bit of evidence. But he voluntarily agreed to be locked up in a room in the hospital for observation. This voluntary confinement, during which the most prominent bacteriologist, bacteriologist, oh well, in Spain were kept occupied, lasted eight months. After this time, they had to release him. And because of the constant pressure of public opinion and from the local press, which made things increasingly difficult for the hospital management. Despite the most stringent precautions, new cases of typhus continued to appear. Seven inpatients, as well as one young doctor, had died. If Spain would have had a little island for a leper colony, they would most certainly have sent him there, rightly or wrongly. But now they had to once more let him loose among humanity. It was the old Jesuit father, Don Jose Hoyos, known as the most passionate Jamist in all of Spain, who found a solution. He traveled to Seville, searched up the unfortunate George Quintero, and at this point, Dr. Lowenstein interrupted the discourse. Thank you, Baron. We will read the conclusion later. That's a shame, said Miss Marie Stuyvesant. I am very interested in the ending. The story itself is not new to me. At the time, all of Seville was talking about it. Naturally, I understand quite well what you are trying to say, dear sir. Your George was, or still is, a carrier of typhus. Whoever is not immune will get infected by him. And so you think that I am a carrier of, for some typhus of the soul, and it is much much more dangerous than that carried by the Andalusian farmer's son. Is that it? Yes, nodded the attorney. And now we have a Jesuit that is successful in bringing a solution to Quinero's case. First, he began with trying to make the poor fellow understand the nature of his predicament, which all the doctors working on his case had still not made clear to him. 
the same thing that we would like to try with you, Ms. Mary Stuyvesant. We have a tremendous amount of evidence here, and I am convinced that in every single case you will openly, perhaps laughingly, admit to us that everything is true down to the smallest detail. It appears that there are a considerable number of people who are immune to typhus, even without being inoculated. Unfortunately, there has not yet been a vaccine of the soul for the disease that you carry. And even if a large number of individuals were immune to this or any other toxin that you are the carrier of, the full implication of your, please excuse the ugly word, manifold vices or evil influences are so great that scarcely one out of a thousand would not be infected. You see, Quintero can only be held accountable for the typhoid contagion, while you are able to infect people with hundreds of vices, of which every single one is even more dangerous. He paused, coughed, reached for the carafe, and poured himself a glass of water. Ms. Marie Stuyvesant laughed. Since when do you drink water, Fridell? The attorney raised the glass to his lips, but then set it back down again. Since my successful attempt to cut myself loose from you, Marie, it took eight detoxifications in three sanatoriums before I finally learned to stop drinking, because I, thanks to you, was nearly unsavable. Since then... You are forgetting something, Fridell, the lady in gray said. Even before I made your acquaintance, you could drink a good glass. Isn't that true? Yes, yes, cried the attorney. Certainly I drank, like any good student. But through you, through you alone, I became a drunkard. Mary Stuyvesant put down her cigarette. Well... And now you are all healed, so much for the better. Yet I don't see any reason why I shouldn't have a glass of wine to drink. I think the gentlemen are not being very gallant. She looked across the green table. Mr. Del Greco, you have a Chablis there in front of you. Won't you bring me a glass? The Italian sprang up immediately, placed the glass on her table, and filled it. Then he set the bottle down next to her. My pleasure, he murmured, and then went back to his seat. The tall woman raised her glass. Slowly, she said, To your health, Dr. Siegfried Lowenstein. It is much more fitting that I now address you so, because the Friedel that I once knew would never have toasted me with a glass of water. For the second time, the attorney took up the glass of water, put it to his lips, moistening them. He took a swallow, then fiercely slammed the glass back down on the table. He stared at the woman and bit his lips. The devil take me, he whispered. The devil take me. Then with a quick movement, he grabbed the bottle of red wine that was sitting in front of his neighbor, the baron filled his glass, water glass to the top and emptied it in one gulp. Oh, smiled Maurice Stuyvesant. Oh. Silently, Dr. Lowenstein showed the portfolio to the right. Olbing, the financier, took it up. Our investigations have not been one-sided, good lady, he began. If we on one side present all the evil that you have brought into the world, we also want to present the other side, and as much as possible have collected that which speaks in your favor. That is what I have been entrusted with. The gentlemen have especially selected me because it is my nature, nature to be very skeptical and critical and not to take things at face value even though I have every reason not to think favorably of you. You have, as you will remember, good lady, once persuaded me to make a certain investment that, shall we say, did not meet the customary 
requirements of the old Obing Bank. She interrupted him. You bore me. You know very well that I know nothing of business matters. You bore me exactly like you did once before those many years ago in Hamburg with those dreary proposals of all kinds of combinations and possibilities, forcing me very much against my will to listen to them. At the time, I told you that your views on business ethics seemed exceptionally childish to me, that every filthy rich man, as far as I was concerned, got their gold from stealing and robbing, that each one of them was a swindler, a cheat, or a thief, one or the other. And that is most certainly right, because that's the only way a man can make the money of others flow into his own pockets. Only, I think, such a man should at least be honest with themselves and not do as you did, always attempting to justify your actions. And with each newly swindled million, go complaining through the world as remorse incarnate. All of that was very theoretical. I have no idea what kind of business you were involved in, and I have certainly never earned a penny through your business dealings. Randolph Ulbing nodded. It was exactly as you say, good lady. But I thought about what you said to me, and after a long time, came to the conclusion that you were correct. Today I am even more than ever of this opinion especially after the experience of the past year. I have acted like every other profit maker and today am several million richer than I was at the time. You should be grateful to me, said Miss Stoivasan. I am not grateful to you, he retorted. The reputation of the ancient house of Olbing as founded by my great-grandfather, was spot, spotless in the financial world like no other house. It remained that way until right up to the day when you explained it all to me. Inquire about our reputation today. I have increased the capital of the house tenfold. I have not done anything different than the other houses, but have done very much many things that my ancestors would never have even considered doing before, or myself either. I can easily justify any of these machinations before the court, even to myself, when I am sitting in my office. Yet I cannot help but be seized with disgust when I open a newspaper and from out of every line the troubles of the world stare out at me, troubles that I so cleverly take advantage of for myself. I followed your advice, and it has made my life miserable. I have no desire, said the woman, to listen to your bullshit. What I told you was no special wisdom of mine. It has been printed and repeated a thousand times. You never paid any attention to it before. And now that you should suddenly hear it from my own mouth and be so strongly influenced, that is your own fault. I am not lying to you, replied the banker, because it was your influence alone, that which my watered-down stock honesty instinctively recoiled at, sounded like a universal truth when it came from your lips. And so, good lady, it is your fault as well as mine. Miss Marie threw her cigarette far out into the room. Her voice rang sharp and clear. Mr. Olbing, she said, you are not a good-looking man. You already know that. It is no pleasure to look at you. Do you shave yourself? In any case, I don't understand how you can look at yourself in the mirror every day and not cut your own throat. It would certainly be an end to your all of your remorse. Dr. Earhart repressed a quick smile. Let's not get too personal, he said. Mr. Randolph is more of a gentleman than you think, Miss Stuyvesant. What he has to say is flattering enough for you. The banker picked up a sheaf of papers. 
I have determined, good lady, and you can believe me that I have resisted this conclusion with both hands and feet, that you are one of the most kind-hearted, decent, upstanding persons that has ever lived. Miss Marie Stuyvesant is completely incapable of any base or mean activity. Her boundless love for all animals is known by everyone that ever comes in contact with her. It is even more certain that she has loaned or given away more than three quarters of her not inconsiderable income without demanding any interest. Year in and year out, Miss Stoyvesant has supported young artists and students and has done it in such a manner that none of them ever felt she was giving alms. During and after the war years, she acted in such an unselfish manner the lady in gray slapped her gloves against her knee. That's enough, Mr. Olving, she cried. While I don't like it that you all see me as a criminal, it is certainly even more unpleasant, yes, even unbearable, that you want to list my little virtues. I urgently ask the gentleman to desist. Banker Olving hesitated, turned with a glance to the other gentleman. Lowenstein, said Dr. Earhart, you have agreed to be the chairman? The attorney startled. He again took the bottle from the baron, filled his glass, and emptied it in short swallows. Give me the files, he murmured. Mr. Von Axe handed them back to him. I think, he continued, that the gentlemen are in agreement to adhere to the wishes of the lady. It is only to justify our own actions that we have gathered this potentially rich material. I would like you to know, we know very well that the good is quickly forgotten while the evil swells up and grows. We are all completely convinced that we have only discovered a small portion of the good that you have done in your life. We have determined that in at least three cases you have put your life at risk to save another. In one instance, it was only for a dog. More than once, you have personally demonstrated your courage, which even the best shock troops would accord the highest honors, and have demonstrated dozens of times exactly the same proud courage, the same high regard for everything that opposes you. Never have you caused anyone any grief, and I am well permitted to say we know of no other woman of greater magnanimity. Friedel, said the woman, and it rang like a reproach. Just a moment, he continued. I must say this, because it clarifies a good portion of the immense possibilities of your influence. You may rightly be considered, Ms. Marie Stuyvesant, as the most elegant woman of our century. You have more taste in every respect than the best artists of our age. Your extraordinary talent with a pen and a brush have long been counted among those of modern art and literature. It is not easy for someone to withstand your natural charm and grace. Oh, please don't interrupt me. I am almost finished. Even if I could sing your praises in this manner for hours, only one more thing I must bring up, because it is something which came as a complete surprise to most of us. It is the fact that you, Miss Mar Marie Stuyvesant, even though you have been wading knee-deep through pools of sin and hells of temptation, still have the purest soul of any human today. Amen, said the woman, and with that I hope this chapter is closed. According to your wish, continued the attorney. But before we open the next, you have to admit that we have thoroughly studied the facts and given you full credit for what you have done. Also, everything that we have just presented makes it scarcely necessary for you to even speak. It also serves a final purpose in exposing the immense phenomenon of your influence. Mr. Del Greco, will you please read a few excerpts from out of our files? It would take much too long if we completely read all of them. 
the naval lieutenant who was sitting at the furthest left end of the green table began to read. In the year 1910, an unusual epidemic brought out, broke out among the students of the Munich Art Academy. The young people were drinking ether by the dozens. An entire group of them perished miserably. Excuse me, Erwin Earhart interrupted the Italian. I would like to ask a few questions of Miss Stuyvesant. Am I permitted to hope that she will answer me? Certainly, the lady nodded. What started this epidemic? Naturally, you know all about it. They say that you started it. Ms. Marie shrugged her shoulders. I occasionally drank ether, like I occasionally take any other narcotic. It is highly likely that some of the young students were there. It is quite possible that they themselves then took ether and even encouraged others. We have, the engineer continued, in our files a number of such cases, and they are, as you say, regarding almost all of them, narcotics. You, Miss Stuyvesant, were never addicted to alcohol, morphine, or cocaine. Never a habitual user of muscarine, mescal, opium, or heroin, or anything else. But very many people who saw you take these narcotics, heard you talk of them, or read about them in some of your books, took them. And many of these people became occasional users. Several of them perished, died in institutions, or committed suicide. What for you was an occasional thrill, perhaps a pleasant hour, was for many others a slow death. Through whom were you introduced to opium, Count Thun? Through one of the good lady's books, the Count said calmly. I don't regret it. I know that I have become scarcely much of a man in the conventional sense. I know that I will perish through opium and know what a bitter end that is, yet I don't regret it. What happened to me personally is not because of her. The lady in gray looked at him, and her voice almost rang with gratitude. Count, what are you smoking? It is pathetic. I can only get mixtures out of India and at exorbitant prices. I thought as much, said Ms. Marie. That's why I asked. I have some of the best Chinese opium, and will have some sent to your room. Count. She interrupted herself laughing. Or is that perhaps an attempt to influence a judge? We are not your judges, said Dr. Lowenstein. There is only one person that is permitted to sit in judgment of you, and you will soon enough hear his name. Please continue to read. Sir Del Greco took up another sheet of paper. Here are clippings out of magazines and newspapers, brochures and books. They are all about Miss Marie Stuyvesant's art dealings. They vary in theme, in all kinds of tones, shimmer in all kinds of colors, but in one way they are all the same. Namely, how she has had a tremendous influence on promoting this type of art and also that this influence is the most pernicious that an artist has ever produced. For generations to come, says this one, people will not be able to resist this poison. The striking feature of this art is that there are those in the world, those, as Schiller would say, the gods graciously cover with night and grayness, and those who step with light feet and don't describe anything horrible at all. Everything is natural. Nothing is unnatural. This is the dogma, and because of that, it is not abnormal, perverse, or unnatural. It can all appear very beautiful, and indeed, far more often appears as normal, common. But then, if it is beautiful, that makes it good. It is not a lie to say that in all the drawings of Stuyvesant, like in her papers, everything is, in fact, of a higher beauty. This beauty is so tangible that the hands can grasp it, 
and that makes it harder to pull away from. So that the public in all countries, and most especially the youth, drink in this art, drink it in greedily, turn away from normal everyday things in disgust, and seek the labyrinth of the nightlife. Unfortunately, the perverse is not as beautiful to them. Instead, they merely become wrapped in the magical cloak of this art, and there stands not only a gifted artist to instruct, but even more of the masses that have been seduced. They run after the will-o'-the-wisp and run rejoicing into the swamp, believing they will find beauty only to finally end up in the mud and filth. Every principal, every university lecturer, every judge can bear witness to the soul-shattering effects that this type of art invokes, if they themselves are not already infected by it. Ms. Stoyvesant, Dr. Earhart, continued, And do you believe that this critic is correct? She answered, I don't read my books and I don't critique them. I write them. That is all. Like I draw my illustrations. Should I then draw and write differently? Do you demand that a hedgehog give birth to a rhinoceros? That an ostrich lay caviar? Erwin Earhart thought, This woman is amazing. Proceed. The attorney turned to Mr. Del Greco. The naval lieutenant took up his file again. We have various detailed reports about the so-called Stuyvesant balls. They were already here before the outbreak of the war, but have become quite fashionable all over Europe during these past years. Two of our reports appear especially interesting. One from out of Zurich, the other from Stockholm. All the participants appeared in the bizarre costumes of your black and white illustrations in which the so-called sexy outfits were developed to the highest levels of refinement. Would you tell me, Engineer Earhart said, asked, how this all came about? Ever new variations and styles with the same theme, Miss Stoyvesant, in your illustrations? A person dressed in such a way that he exudes an irresistible sexual attraction? I possess all of your illustrations and have seen very many outfits that are based upon them. Doubtless the highest recognition of this art is that the bizarre thrill which it evokes is so strong that it would make even a plaster statue sigh with passion. Ms. Marie lit another cigarette. Then, dear sir, I must have fewer feelings than a plaster statue. That is perhaps the reason, because I know what works, and why it works. You see, the entire clothing industry is completely full of sexy outfits, as the learned call them, or at least it attempts to. But all these outfits down through the centuries were designed by amateurs, by tailors, cleaning women, dilettantes who didn't have a clue. At least kings, dukes, and generals understood when they insulted their handsome lieutenants by turning them into sexy dolls. It is amazing, gentlemen, how the sages of this world run around, their heads stuffed full of deep knowledge, and they still don't know the simplest things. Clothing, my revered gentlemen, whether made of feathers or furs or consisting of trousers or skirts, is created by us to serve as a protection against the element. But beautiful clothing has only one purpose, to attract the eye of the opposite sex. That's why the peacock has his radiant plumage, the lion his proud mane. Whoever cannot see what nature herself teaches us is born blind. That my outfits are sexually attractive is certainly true, in exactly the same way the birds of paradise or the lemon moths are. And I would like to say, Count Thone, that you made a much better impression on the young ladies when you were stuck in a hussar's uniform. There was no reply, so the Italian continued. 
Everywhere these balls degenerated into the most shameful orgies. The notorious Klotz Arts balls in Paris were nothing in comparison to those of Ms. Stuyvesant. All they did with their shamelessness was to bring the two sexes together. While these are celebrations of every kind of perverse lust, it is most certain that no other time showed such a boundless neglect of morals as ours. And this is because Ms. Marie Stuyvesant burst out laughing. I carry the blame for that? Oh, you moralist. Our time is more open, that is all. Immoral? Oh, dear God, it is just as moral and immoral as any other time has been. Is there anything immoral about sexuality? Perhaps because it is simply natural? Well, does that make all of nature unnatural? Because the sex lives of the entire animal world are full of thousands of wild combinations? which any decent man would find exceptionally abnormal and perverse. But even the animal world must seem moderate compared to the exceptionally variegated love life of the plant world. Just take a closer look into nature. Anyone who maintains that it is in any way normal and natural according to your terms of what is natural is either a liar or a complete idiot. But in the end, we humans also belong to nature. You misunderstand us, declared Erwin Earhart. None of us suffer from moralistic tendencies, and none of us are thinking of trying to blame you for that. If you would have listened to all that Mr. Del Greco had had to say, you would have easily noticed that our, what our intentions really are. These balls, which op occupy thousands of conversations, and to which thousands go to in all cities, are not in themselves any more significant than any other fad that you will always find in the cities. What is important is the masses of people that attend them. What is important is that the young people turn away from their work in droves and have only one thing in their heads, to live in their senses. What is important is that the norms which have shaped our societies through many centuries, whether rightly or wrongly, is not of our concern. They have been broken and laughingly ridiculed. These mores have certainly held our instinct in strong bonds. You, Miss Stuyvesant, have torn these chains asunder. We cannot spend the entire day pointing out every instance. We can only provide you a couple of examples, but these examples are typical, and you could find a thousand others just like them. Please, Colonel Thursby, will you enlighten the lady on the parts of her story which for the most part is still unknown to her? Colonel Lionel Thursby stood up. His fingers gripped the bottle of whiskey that was sitting in front of him and held it tightly. You will recall, Madame Stuyvesant, that you gave a speech in London in 1913. At the time, I was very enamored with you and had followed you all around the world for many years. At the invitation of the Lotus Club, you spoke of several of your causes. At the same time, there was a display of your drawings and paintings in another room of the club. That evening, I brought my sister and brothers along who had known about my infatuation with you for a long time and were curious to meet you in person. That evening you read a story about two brothers who were in love with each other. You remember which story I'm talking about. Well, that what you spoke of was the case with my brothers. You certainly didn't put this unholy inclination into them, but you were the one that inspired them to turn their harmless brotherly affections for each other into something less innocent, and encouraged it to blossom. You taught my brothers that everything that has roots has its own right to exist, to blossom, and to bear fruit. It was through you that they first learned what kind of love they shared. Then came what had to come. The two surrendered to their strong passions. 
Six weeks later, I found out about it. After six months, the servants learned of it. After a year, all of London knew. When my brothers, both army officers, were stationed with their regiments at the outbreak of the war, they received very chilly receptions from the men. They cursed them and finally outright rejected them. And the two shot themselves together that same night. That is very unfortunate, said Miss Stuyvesant. <clears throat> I have never met the two gentlemen, Colonel. You forgot to introduce them to me. But you met my sister, madam, right? Screamed the colonel. She came to you after the performance, then to your hotel on the next day, and traveled with you as you left London the day after that. The lady in gray nodded. Yes, she did. She followed me just like you did, girl. Burdened me with her feelings exactly like you did with your feelings. Feelings which I, even with the best of will, could not return. For you or for her. I am sorry, Colonel, but I am a loner. Don't forget that. How can you demand that I give myself to anyone, male or female, who desires me? My sister came back to London, said the Colonel, two weeks after the deaths of my brothers. She followed them. They found her poisoned, with your photo in her hand. But you, dear Colonel, you are still alive, said Marie Stuyvesant. Alive and wanting to make me responsible for something that you wouldn't care anything at all about if it had happened to anyone else. The Colonel screamed. I live because death doesn't want me. I have loved you since the very first day I saw you. I am bound to you by three deaths. In this past year, I have had no thoughts at all except for one. Maurice Stuyvesant, I hate you, hate you, madame, and know it very well that it is love like it always was, and that it will never end until, until he stammered. <clears throat> and suddenly sat down, wiping the beads of sweat from his forehead with a silk handkerchief. Dr. Earnhardt said quickly, May I ask you, Miss Stuyvesant, how many people have lost their lives in a similar manner like Miss Thursby, or how many such cases you're aware of? We ourselves have been able to determine. Miss Marie interrupted him. Put a couple more zeros on it if it makes you happy. I don't see what difference it makes. Dr. Lowenstein gulped down one glass after another. But we do, Marie Stuyvesant, he cried. We do. One case means nothing. But when you take all of them together, that is something else. And that is what we are speaking of, these gentlemen that are sitting here across from you. And we know that it is easier to grasp something that we know from personal experience. That is why we are sharing these things with you from our own personal lives. We have promised not to spare ourselves in this. You have seen how openly the gentlemen speak. Even Sir Del Greco believes that you are the cause of his life being in ruin. You know that his wife is an extraordinarily beautiful woman who is loved everywhere. Today, this woman is a great international whore who travels from one health spot to another and belongs to anyone who can afford her. A single small remark you once made is to blame for her behavior. <coughs> Am I permitted to ask which remark that was, said the lady in gray? The Del Grecos made your acquaintance in Porto in Porto Rose two years ago. Both were great admirers of your art and naturally very happy to be allowed to get to know you better. Isabel del Greco was very attached to you. Every word that you spoke, she treated like gospel. You sketched both Mr. del Greco as well as his wife, Isabel. And it was during one of those sittings that you laid your sketchbook down on your knee and said, I must do something different this time. 
When Mrs. Isabel asked, you answered, My God, he has a magnificent figure, a genuine model, but there is something terribly boring as well. Tell me, Miss Isabel, isn't he sometimes frightfully boring? Yes, good heavens, gentlemen, cried Miss Marie. Wasn't I right? Just look at the good hands, especially his good looks. He is boring enough to make me want to puke. Sir Del Greco coughed. Your grace, your grace. Perhaps it is so. It is certainly so if you say it is. But my wife saw it then for the first time. And from that day on, I was boring to her, as you say. Boring enough to make you want to puke. She left me, found someone else, and perhaps he became boring as well after a short time. And because of that, is that also typical, asked Ms. Marie. The attorney nodded. It is typical in that there is something that you said, in all innocence, that in another person's brain is capable of taking on a totally different meaning. Look, Ms. Marie, at the white hairs of my neighbor, the young Baron von X. They turned white in a few months, not through romance, not through some fearful experience, but as always through you, even though he has just now seen you for the first time in his life. Several years ago, Miss Marie, one evening you were gambling in a casino in San Sebastian and had just lost some 20,000 pesetas. Then you went with several other well-known ladies and gentlemen who had also been unlucky that evening to a coffee house where the others were in genuine bad moods. You, for the most part, were in an extraordinarily good mood. You paid for your coffee with a hundred franc note that you unexpectedly found in your purse and gave the rest to the waiter as a tip. You made fun of the gloomy faces of the others and philosophized that the true charm of a high-stakes game is that the money doesn't really have any value anymore, that you only collect yellow, red, blue, and white chips or give them away, and after a short time completely lose any sense of the value of money, and that you sense this sovereign sensation even more deeply after you have just lost everything, and not after you win. It happened that there was a gentleman nearby, totally unknown to you, who overheard what you said, and was very taken with it. This same gentleman, who never gambled himself, Years later, told his friend, the Baron von X, about it. The young painter, who had until this time never even considered touching a card or trying his luck at any other form of gambling, was deeply impressed, and with this was deeply impressed with this seemingly innocent remark. He felt a strange lust to gamble, resisted it for a week, and then, at the next half opportunity, sat down at the baccarat table in a club. After that, he was stuck to that table, losing his fortune in six months, as well as that of his mother. The sensation that gambling brought you, unfortunately, didn't ever come to him, but his gray hair will remind him of you for the rest of his life. Maurice Stuyvesant observed the young painter carefully. I find that he dresses exceptionally well, she noted. Attorney Lowenstein paged through the file. Another page. He began once more. You have, from time to time, Miss Marie, felt the desire to appear on stage. In some cases, even plays that you directed yourself. Each one was a small sensation and most certainly a success. Not on account of theatrical talent, but because of the influence of your strong personality which even made technical glitches seem charming and not failures. Is that a crime? asked Marie Stuyvesant. No more than any of the other things that we have been discussing, declared the attorney. Only there is one thing, that your example drove a crowd of young people to the stage who would never have thought of doing it before and all of them believed that they could be successful despite a lack of talent and education, 
simply through strength of personality, believing they could simply go straight from the street onto the stage and be successful at it. The theater director scarcely knew who to save from all the children suffering from Stuyvesant mania, as it was called among the performers of the stage. A strong personality is naturally very hard to find, and the end of the story is that the vast army of prostitutes was made that much richer. The attorney picked up another page and continued without even pausing. Here are a number of cases grouped together, which even though very different, have one thing in common. They involve cases of ab absurd bets. In one of your stories, Marie, there was a man who believed that he could do anything, and because of that, he made all kinds of improbable wagers. In this man, you had to have described a good portion of yourself, because you also gladly make such bets, and most of the time easily win them. I myself was there the time you bet that you would raise a little flag on the top of the tower of the Cologne Cathedral. You prepared yourself ahead of time, seeking out the best roofer in the city as a teacher, taking on a series of easier objects, and then finally winning the bet. Once in Rome, you made the bet that you would go around in men's clothing for three months, living your life as before. You did it, visited clubs, theaters, concerts, and church, went in your bet. The hero of your story bet, but I don't need to tell you that. Very well, these people whose names are listed here wanted to do the same as you, seeking honor and fame and doing crazy things. It could be that several succeeded, but not these. I have here a list of 14 names, four of them paid for their foolishness with their lives. One young lady ended up in a lunatic asylum for several years. Two are crippled for life. The rest are well and healthy today, but have paid for their lust to make such bets by suffering with long illnesses. The attorney paused, emptied his glass, and took up another sheet of paper. Here, Miss Marie, we have the cases. But the lady in gray interrupted him. It is enough, she said calmly. I will not lie. Everything that you have determined happened exactly as you say. If I think about it, gentlemen, I can come up with several other instances that you don't know about. Just yesterday, I received a letter from a doctor in Amsterdam that showers me with the heaviest reproach. You see, somewhere I once supported the ancient belief that it was a crime to keep incurable mental illness, completely crippled or idiotic children, and the like alive in those conditions for many years. Society not only has the right, but the duty to terminate them. You all know that this position has been raised for years by scientific authorities in all countries all over the world. And naturally, the doctor in Amsterdam knows this just as well as you do. Well, this doctor had an idiotic little daughter that made his life and that of his wife into a living hell. Finally, he decided, in agreement with his wife, to put an end to this daily torment. He poisoned the child. Yet his wife took this death, which should have been her salvation, so to heart that she presumably, in a complete nervous breakdown, threw herself out of the window. But the doctor, broken down at the fate of his wife, went and turned himself in to the authorities. He was immediately arrested and sent me this letter from prison. I, and I alone, he wrote, carry the blame for all his misfortune, because it was my plea alone for the known demand that had fallen into his hands through coincidence, and in the end, it was the final deciding factor that caused him to do it. Without me, his wife and child would still be alive. Without me, he would not be accused of murder and sitting in prison. She opened her purse, took out the letter, and laid it in front of him on the table. Here, gentlemen, is the letter. I will not be responding to it. Add it to your files if you want. It is, as far as I know, the last instance of that 
what you want to consider and certainly a fine example of your hypothesis. I have, I have prepared more if you would like to see, but I think that we have more than enough and can now bring this to a close. Will you now please tell me what it is that you want from me? Attorney Dr. Lowenstein was not to be hurried. He gathered the papers that had been strewn right and left all over the table, arranged them carefully, and put them back in his briefcase. Since no one spoke, he finally asked, Do any of the gentlemen have anything else to say? The others declined. Then he said, Then I believe that we can bring this to a close, since neither side has raised any objection to the factual basis of the case, we can consider them as completely proven. We have agreed ahead of time upon the division of the following roles. While I should lead the proceedings and the individual gentlemen would act as witnesses as needed, Dr. Earhart is to play the part of public prosecutor, to indict you as betrayer of society, of humanity. We have chosen him on purpose because he is the only one of the seven of us that has no special reason to hate you, Ms. Murray. Dr. Earhart has never had the honor of meeting you and has never been in any type of relationship with you. He is most certainly not biased. Please begin, Doctor. Dr. Erwin Earhart began immediately. I received the aforementioned letter from Colonel Thursby a year ago, the same hour that the book dealer sent your newest portfolio, in fact. I had been asked to have a look at your drawings. Colonel Thursby is an old friend of mine from my student days. I was aware that this man would have never written such a letter if he knew of any other way to avoid it. He related everything that you have heard out of my own mouth this evening and added a description of his state of mind, which made a heart-wrenching impression. From him came the stimulus that something must be done to stop and control the person through whom so much misery came into this world. In that moment, I felt sympathy for the colonel and became even more resolved in these feelings after a look at your drawings, Miss Stuyvesant. I immediately called up attorney Lowenstein who came immediately, and we consulted through the night. The following day, we set to work. The result, you already know. I am, Miss Stuyvesant, a sincere admirer of your incredible art. I know that its suggestiveness is perhaps unique, and bow to this suggestiveness as well as to the artwork itself. But even this restless admiration cannot cloud my clear gaze, in which I and which has grown sharper and more discerning during this past year, have been able to recognize that your influence, Miss Stuyvesant, is one of the most unholy that the world has ever known. Through your books and your drawings, you have turned masses of simple, decent individuals into just as many that are no longer fit for society. And in many cases, your creations have caused even much, much more damage. But even if you had never written or drawn anything, the infectious, suggestive influence of your personality is strong enough, almost always, to poison everyone in encounters with its sweet poison. This poison, Miss Stuyvesant, you carry inside of you, and when it is expressed, it doesn't harm you at all. Of George Quintero, the typhoid carrier from Andalusia, it was reported to us that he was very good-natured, friendly, hard-working, and well-liked by everyone. Multiply that many hundredfold, and you will get an idea of your own image. Your great magnan magnanimity is recognized everywhere. And it would be very hard to find anyone as hard-working as you, Ms. Marie Stuyvesant. You have had, as do many important people, an instinctive avoidance of praise of any kind, and therefore I will not continue this any further. But I would like to note that this avoidance is grounded upon nothing other than a very refined sense of shame. 
<laughs> which in you, Miss Doivissant, is much more strongly developed than in so many other people. George Quintero certainly had only the best intentions for his fellow men, <clears throat> and against his will brought them torment, disease, and death. And that is exactly what you do, Miss Doivissant. You, like him, turn the Mephistophelian principle into its opposite. You are of the power that always wants to do good and always does evil. Always, always, and forever on your life's path. It is your unavoidable destiny. No, Miss Stuyvesant, let me tell you the end of the unfinished story of your companion in fate, George. The old priest, Don Jose Hoyos, searched him out, lived together with him for a week, fearlessly risking his own life in order to save those of so many others. During this time, he had long conversations about what he, Quintero, re represented to the rest of humanity. Up to that time, the simple man had no conception of what it meant. At first, he, a completely healthy person, could not understand how he could infect other people, and had treated this suspicion as a vile slander, rejecting it completely. After the doctors had explained things to him, this gradually turned into feeling sorry for himself, a feeling that was very much in character for and delusions, but also a feeling of importance because he was of such interest to all the doctors, the newspapers, and the entire public. Father Hoyos didn't take any of this away from him, but he gradually convinced him that he was a danger to society making him understand that his own life meant the certain death of others, of whom many others were certainly much more important than he himself was. He told him that there was no authority and no power in the world that could do anything against him, that there was no law that had been broken. Others who murdered people could be arrested and punished, but not him, because he had not intended to murder anyone. Indeed, he had not known that being close to others brought death, but now he knew. And even though no policeman could arrest him, he would be no better than a murderer if he kept on killing people. No judge would stop him, so he must be his own judge. Slowly, George Quintero began to understand the old priest, but he was a devout Christian and knew very well what the priest was asking. Suicide. But it was a terrible sin to take one's own life. Don Jose showed him the way. Had he ever heard of St. Apolliana? Yes, George knew of her. He was the one with the plier that pulled the huge tooth, the one that you prayed to when you had a toothache. The priest told him the story of this saint. She was condemned to be burned to death. As soon as the pyre was lit, the devout woman was seized with such a longing for a martyr's death that she couldn't wait for the executioner to seize her. She herself jumped into the blaze. That was suicide. Yet the Catholic Church didn't consider it as such. And what of the devout woman's soul? And the devout nuns of Seban, and the Benedictine cloister in Brixen, they trembled in fear when the French invaded the land. Andreas Hoffer, Speckbacher, Father Hospinger, and their people had to withdraw deep into the mountains. The Jacobite troops were already in the valley, and the nuns knew what awaited them. Rape, robbing them of their innocence. So they jumped out of the windows into the deep gorge dashing their poor bodies on the boulders. And even though the loss of bodily innocence in this case would not have stained the moral purity of their souls, and even though the nuns must have known this, the church proclaimed them free from guilt. But he, George Quintero, certainly had an even greater reasons than these women. If he gave up his own life, oh, it would be a free-willing martyr's death given for the lives of his countrymen. Then, in the last moment, he would feel the remorse, 
which the church demanded. And if he couldn't feel this remorse for himself, then God in his mercy would grant him forgiveness. This, he, a priest of God, would guarantee. And he was so convinced of this that he promised him a Christian burial and consecrated ground. And Don Jose said, If it is God's will, I will not get infected. If he wills differently, then let me be the last sacrifice, dear brother. The two of them spent three days in confession and passionate prayer. Then George Quintero stabbed himself with his folding knife. The Jesuit father kept his word. Despite all the protests of the clergy within the city, he ensured that his friend was buried in the cemetery. He himself accompanied him to his final resting place. Two days later, he came down with typhus. In three days, he was dead. He was the unlucky last sacrifice. Miss Marie Stuyvesant. We have decided to imitate the method of the old priest, like he did with Quintero. We have attempted to convince you what a terrible influence your life and works mean for humanity. We are not allowed to offer you the consolation that the priest would give for his confessional, because it is grounded in a faith that you don't share. As George Quintero himself said, a higher judge stands over him, and because of the mercy of this judge, the old priest could absolve him of his sin. Over you, Ms. Stuyvesant, stands no one. You are the last and final judge. We have nothing more to add. Our work is complete. We turn it over to the many-sided criminal, the poisoner and murderess, Marie Stuyvesant, and to your own judge, Marie Stuyvesant. In the interest of your humanity, we pray for a just judgment. Erwin Earhart remained standing upright for a while and then sat back down. No one spoke. Not a sound in the entire hall. You could hear the harsh cries of a seagull coming from the sea. Minutes passed by. Once the lady gave a laugh, then it was quiet again. Finally, she spoke. I don't understand much of legal process, but I do know that after the prosecutor, the defense is allowed to speak. You gentlemen have given out roles, but it appears that you have neglected this one. You don't want me to speak in my own defense. Otherwise, you would not have immediately wanted me to pass judgment. In accordance with your wishes, gentlemen, I renounce all defense. It is most certainly extremely rare to let the accused sit in judgment of themselves. I think that he would have every right to refuse to sit as judge. That would certainly be the most comfortable thing for me to do. You see, gentlemen... The analogy between my case and that of your Andalusian disease carrier has a large hole in it. I am amazed that you didn't see it for yourselves, because in reality the poor devil was not at all his own judge. The priest judged and condemned him when he convinced him that divine justice required him to give up his life, and that his death alone would free humanity from the danger of becoming infected by him. George Quintero's role was only that of the announcer, the executioner. He carried out the sentence that had been pronounced upon him. You are requesting the same from me. You, gentlemen, have long since passed judgment, and only desire that I myself carry it out. But you are not as honorable as the Jesuit father. Despite the intensive work of an entire year, you are far from convincing me like the priest convinced his confessional. Don Jose assumed responsibility before the entire world and before the divine judgment, on which he deeply believed for what he did, and he paid for it with his own life. You, gentlemen, have not taken on any responsibility at all, and are not in the slightest danger, because you are all forgiven. Apart from Dr. Earhart, you have long, long ago been infected by me, if indeed such an infection is, impossible, is possible. Now you wash your hands in innocence and leave the judgment to me, 
and after that to carry it out. Very well, gentlemen. I will not refuse to sit as judge, and this is my judgment. I declare myself free. You have, gentlemen, presented the case of George Quintero based on a Christian worldview, but God created this man, created him just as he was, with a severe defect on one side, the disease of typhus, of which he was a carrier. But on the other side, with an even greater portion, he carried a strong antibody that made him immune to the poison of typhus. So he did. He had to do so. So he carried his guilt to the divine judgment. But a human produced that judgment over him. And because he was himself a human, he believed in this judgment and in his guilt. Now the case of such an innocent enemy of mankind like this happens very rarely, but is in no way that rare among other creatures. Isn't every viper a danger to humans? Isn't the rat a carrier of cholera? The mosquito of malaria? But who would try to get these mosquitoes, rats, and vipers to kill themselves? Society maintains that it has this right. I personally am of the opinion that it does not. But that is beside the point. The basic right of society is to protect itself and to destroy whatever is a danger to it. That is why we exterminate rats, snakes, murderers, and so many others. When society in certain cases doesn't dare eradicate that which poisons, like Quintero, that is certainly only the fault of society, which doesn't consider it that serious. If I choose to consider the poisonous cobra as sacred, then I must accept the consequences as those in India do. It is still unharmed no matter how many people it poisons to death. George Quintero was a disease carrier. Well then, it was up to society to stop him, to destroy him. If they cannot, if they won't, how can they then demand that the poor poisonous viper act like a human and do what society itself doesn't have the courage to do? You say, gentlemen, that I am a much worse plague on humanity than that of the Andalusian peasant. Through my drawings and my little books, still even more through my personality, I have, you say, infected humanity with all kinds of poisons. I am immune myself. Yet every hour, on all sides, I exhale a deadly pestilence. But home, gentlemen, could Quintero infect with typhus? Not the few that were immune as he was. The disease carriers, really, he would hardly encounter them. And not the others, the ones who were naturally immune. And finally, not the people who had been inoculated against typhus. I think it is exactly the same with me. No one can be affected can be infected by me who is immune by nature or because of strong antibodies, whatever kind of antibodies that might be, because my poison is a poison of the soul, and I can think of many divine antidotes, whether it be religion, philosophy, or some other strong faith. To all these people I present no danger at all. The basilisk can only harm those whose bodies are receptive to it, so it is so is it not the disease alone it must find a suitable host and so it is i think also with me the spark that must might radiate from me can only burst into flame at an encounter suitable tinder i am convinced gentlemen that no powerful sorcerer can somehow draw out of a person that which is not in him to begin with this applies to the good as well as to the bad no one will become a poet that is not born to be a poet, and no one will become a murderer who has not had the possibility of becoming a murderer slumbering within him from birth. But perhaps, perhaps, some unknown magic word will throw that tightly locked door of the soul wide open. And that is all that I do, gentlemen, only that. You say I infect many souls. I believe that is not true at all. I believe, furthermore, that I only encourage the external development of something that is already growing in the soul, the seed of which was there from the beginning. 
You think that doesn't make any difference? I believe it does. You call me, Dr. Earhart, a part of the power that always wants to do good and always does evil. As flattering as that sounds, I must disagree. I have never wanted to do neither good nor bad, really. I have done some good, and as you know, a lot of evil, but a result for one side or the other has never been my intention. If I have any intention at all, I can express it to paraphrase Goa. I believe that everything that exists before it dies has the right to live in its own way. In doing that, it can die as it pleases. Gentlemen, we stand in two camps between which there can be no agreement. You represent the great humanitarian belief that the welfare of collective society is the only criterion against which all things should be measured. Contrary to that, I am completely indifferent to the welfare and misery of humanity. I know a millionaire in New York who for over 20 years has established many little milk stations across the city, and daily at his own expense thousands of poor children are nourished with the milk. There is no question at all that this beautiful gesture has made many children healthy, perhaps even saved the lives of many of them. This man is considered a great benefactor of humanity, but in my own eyes he has only done in his own way something which makes him happy, found a way to spend his money. If only out of the hundred thousands of children who drank his milk over the years, a single Rembrandt would appear then I would be grateful to him. Unfortunately, I have not heard of any. A Dante or a Beethoven, a Napoleon or a Goethe should have all the privileges of a divine being. But the man of the masses of humanity has only one privilege, which is to die. And it is no concern of mine at which speed it happens. I have, as you say, gentlemen, breathed many poisons into many souls, or as I prefer to say, provided many starving poisonous plants with the fertilizer they needed to blossom and flourish. So, Baron X became a gambler. Isabel de Greco became a prostitute. Count Thun became an opium addict. Financier Olbein, a swindler, and attorney Lowenstein, an alcoholic. But you forget, none of you became something that you were not before. And if your beautiful wife, Mr. Del Greco, had remained true to you, she still would have the soul of a prostitute. She proved that when she left you and ran to another. And you, Friedel, would have remained an alcoholic if you had taken 20 cures, lived in the most abstaining country in the world, and never touched another drop of wine. You gentlemen, you sit above me to judge me for yourself and at the same time representing many others who are exactly like you. Every one of you has a vice, and every one of you knows that I am free of it. I have tasted every single one of all the temptations, tried every sin that I knew of, have experienced the sensation that every temptation brings, thoroughly experienced it, but only for one person, purpose. To become acquainted with it. You, gentlemen, you, and those like you, you are the slaves of some little temptation. But I, I am the mistress over all of them. And because I am free, because I stand above them, that is why you persecute me. Your desire, deeply convinced of your own insignificance, my own annihilation, then you closet yourself together and believe in your politic, pathetic collective belief that a nothing and still another nothing and many thousand nothings are in the end a mighty force. You confuse yourself, gentlemen. You don't even have enough power to destroy the hated creature that now stands before you. You place the verdict in my own hands. Well then, I proclaim myself free. Maurice Stuyvesant didn't raise her voice. She spoke very calmly, very quietly, and with conviction. She didn't wait for a reaction from the seven gentlemen. She said, I thank you, gentlemen. Now you can go. No one answered.
They sat and didn't move. Then Count Thun stood up, took the key from the table, walked with uncertain steps to the door. Sir Del Greco close behind him. They went out, leaving the door wide open. Financier Olbein stood up, then the young painter and attorney Lowenstein. Finally, they came out from behind the table. Colonel Thursby came back, remained standing in front of the lady. His black eyes flickered and then sank. His lips twitched. Despite that, he couldn't find the words. He bit his lips, then went out like the others. She watched him go, smiled, put her cigarette down, then stood up, sighed softly. Then she went to the window, drew the curtains back, looked out at the bay over which the moon lay. There was still one person in the hall. He came back, stepped up to her, spoke. I am Erwin Earhart, engineer, manufacturer, inventor. Rich enough, if you reckon in dollars. She turned around. You? Didn't you say that I have never done anything to you? What do you want? He said quietly, Will you marry me? Must it be that, like that, doctor? The air is sticky in here. Don't you agree? Come along. We will do a little sailing in the moonlight. 